every great movement has a beginning. And the Book of Acts is the story that chronicles the beginning of the greatest movement the world has ever seen. As we study together today, remember, we are writing the next chapter right now in this generation. The Book of Acts. Well, I am excited to be able to preach this chapter of Acts, and so we're going to jump right in. Uh, a lot of you are looking at me like, Pastor Des, why do you have this big sweater on? Uh, in my head, it is fall, okay? I am from the Midwest. I am tired of summer. I need some season, so I have declared it by putting on my fall attire that it is fall. I know it's hot outside. I'm going to be sweating, but I will see you at meet and greet sweating, but I'm still, you know, it's fall time, so... That is what it is. Uh, Pastor Todd left us off in chapter 25, and he really did. He set up this sermon so well because we were introduced to Queen Bernice and King Agrippa. And so now you have it where Paul is getting ready to go on trial in front of King Agrippa. And so we're going to start writing scripture. So we're in Acts 26, starting at verse 3. It reads this. And this is Paul talking to King Agrippa especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. Paul, in a respectful manner, states the comment, King, I know that the Jews have me on trial. I know they're trying to kill me. Understand that there is a history of the past that continues to impact my present. I understand where they're coming from, and Paul says, I understand where they're coming from because what they're trying to do to me, I once did to others. Okay? What they're trying to do to me, what they're trying to do to Paul currently, they are trying to kill Paul, whether that be legally or illegally. By any means necessary, their goal is to kill Paul because from their understanding, they are saying that Paul is preaching and teaching something that is false. So we see this conversation before we unpack it. He's going to give what we call his defense. Paul is on defense, and he is his own criminal attorney right now. And so Paul is represented himself. And so what you see is you're going to see a mixture of a defense trial and you're also going to see a mixture of a testimony, and then you're kind of going to hear a little bit of a sermon. And so Paul is doing all this going on because he is standing in front of King Agrippa. And so we see this conversation very similarly in Acts 9 and Acts 22. It is Paul giving his testimony. Paul's testimony starts to understand that he met Jesus on his Damascus Road experience. I'm going to argue what I've been arguing this entire time. It has not changed. Paul's theological foundation is, I met a man named Jesus. He changed my life. If he can do it for me, he could do it for you. This is all Paul is ever talking about. Paul starts this conversation and ends it with this concept. If you read Paul's epistles, you'll see his honesty. Sometimes, if we're being honest, it almost sounds a little bit of repetition. Reason being is he understands what God has done for him. He understands how the Holy Spirit has impacted his life. And so what he sees is purpose. And so he knows his purpose he has in God. And so he understands that my situation may change, but the story of God never does. And so you see him now in this context preaching and teaching in a different place, to a different crowd, to a different person of power, but you see it without his whole conversation, he still understands that he met a man named Jesus who changed his life. And if he could do it for him, he could do it for you. And if I'm being honest, that's good news for us because we understand that there's an encounter that everybody in here has had with Jesus. And if you haven't had that encounter, all you have to do is ask. So you start to see this conversation that he's having. And so Paul is stating this. And what you see is the truth hasn't changed. The truth of who Paul is hasn't changed. Paul says foundationally, foundationally I met this man. But the problem is the Jews don't see it that way. The Jews have a problem with Paul because we see in Acts 25, 19, that Paul is doing something that you shouldn't do. Paul is preaching that a dead man is alive. That's what they're saying. 
They're saying he should be killed legally or illegally because Paul is preaching that a dead man is alive. Who is this dead man? They're talking about Jesus. Because Jews said Jesus is a prophet, and Paul is saying that's true, but Jesus is also the Savior. So they made a controversial statement. I don't know about you. Maybe you live under a rock. We live in a world of controversial statements. But he made the most controversial statement at the time. This is all Paul said, and people lost it. He said, Jesus is God. This comment of Jesus is God, this teaching that Jesus is God, is what causes separation. And so now Paul is talking to King Agrippa. He's talking to King... My bad, I'm getting too excited. Hold on, we got to bring it back. Okay, I'm going to read some text. Let me feel. We're getting too excited. Y'all, y'all way too excited. Maybe I'm just excited. Okay, so let's do this. All right. So I'm going to give you some context. Verse 6, and now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews. O king, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? The problem occurs because not only do they see Paul's defense, We also see the problem of the Jews' hatred of Paul preaching that Jesus is the fulfillment that they learned about in the Old Testament. Jews understand there was a fulfillment coming. They understood this. And so Paul is saying, you're missing the point because Jesus is the fulfillment to Israel. And they said, no, 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 Paul, you have it all wrong. And so Paul has now spent this upper part of his life preaching and teaching this to different areas. And now all of a sudden, they're trying to kill him. Mind you, if you've been with us the last, I don't know, 25 other chapters, we see probably starting around chapter 10, for the most part, at some point, Paul almost dies. There is a bunch of Paul almost dies. There's a bunch of Paul's almost didn't make it. There's a bunch of Paul's almost. But if we're being honest, if it had not been for God on his side, that almost would have been definite. But since God was on his side, you see that he has a purpose, he has a plan, a direction. And so if we're looking at our lives, there's almost moments of our lives where something happened to us, but you're saying, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. It was God. It was God protecting you. It was God on your side. It was God leading you. And so you see Paul preaches and teaches from the same point of saying, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. And so we have this conversation that's going on here. And so I have a problem, though. I have a problem with Paul's defense. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I watch a lot of law and order. Okay. So I, in my head, I think if I wasn't a pastor, I probably would have a law degree. That's just in my head. Okay. And so I watch a lot of law and order. And so since I watch a lot of law and order, you understand that a criminal defense attorney's job is to, bro- to provide freedom for the person that's on trial. That's your only job. Your only job, I'm going to hire you, and some of them charge a bunch of money and retainer fees because they're saying, I'm going to hire you, and I want to make sure you're getting me off. So Paul is his lawyer. He's his own lawyer, he's his own defense, and it messed me up in text because Paul did the opposite of what I would have done. If I'm on trial, I'm going to tell you all the good things I've done. I'm going to say, well, you you know, King Agrippa, uh, I I have a wife, and she loves me most of the time. Um, No, I'm just joking. (laughs) I I have kids, and and they think I'm amazing 86% of the time. Uh, and, you know, I have a church, and the congregation loves me almost all the time, sometimes not. So I'm, I'm going to give you all my credentials. And now, mind you, the credentials I just said has nothing to do with Paul's. Paul's credentials are through the roof. I mean, he's educated. He's well-spoken. He's a scholar. He has planted churches. I mean, Paul is the man. But Paul does not talk based on what he is. He bases his conversation on what he is not. And so the conversation is interesting. The first thing he comes in In this conversation, you start to see he's talking to King Agrippa. (laughs) He says, at one point, King, I was a murderer and I was a kidnapper. I'm reading this text. I'm saying, Paul, don't say that. Don't say that. You're on trial. Don't don't say that. That's not what you're doing. And so he said, at one point in my life, 
I was a murderer and a kidnapper. I was hanging out with the Jews. I was a powerful one. I got permission to go in and kill Christians. I got permission to kidnap them and relocate them. I had permission for all that. He said, but what I'm on trial for now is they're mad because I told them that Jesus is God and that he can save you. And that if you give your life to him, salvation comes. And all of a sudden, you would think when he talks about his pre-Jesus life, His pre-Jesus life is he was a murderer and a kidnapper. His post-Jesus life is I met a man named Jesus who changed my life. If he could do it for me, he could do it for you. The problem is the Jews have a problem with his post-Jesus life, but they don't care about his pre-Jesus life. For me, it's very interesting that you're not mad that this man used to kill people. I don't know if anybody else don't see a problem with that. But it's almost as if he's on trial saying, hey, I'm on trial for robbery, but um, I didn't didn't rob nobody. I did used to kill people, though. I used to kill people and kidnap them. But robbery, oh, no, I don't steal. That's not what I do. So this is the conversation that Paul is having right now with King Agrippa. And so you see that he continues his defense. And in his defense, he then starts to share about his Damascus Road experience. Now, mind you, if you've been with us in the last 25 chapters, you've heard the Damascus Road experience preached at least two other times, because I'm pretty sure, Pastor Ty, I've preached them in both chapters. (laughs) So it's a very repetitive story. But what you see in the repetition of that story is the foundation understanding that God is still the same God no matter where you go in life. And so what he does is he says, I'm telling you, King Agrippa, the story of my life. Now, he's talking to a different person, a different crowd, even a little bit of a different context, but the story of his life doesn't change. And I'm going to argue, I'm going to tell you this, it doesn't matter who you get around, the message of Jesus Christ doesn't change. It doesn't matter if you're a white person or a black person, a black person or a white person, whether you grew up Baptist, you're talking to Lutherans, whether you're Lutheran, talking to Catholic, everybody has a problem in life. And problems always occur. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is problems don't segregate. Problems happen to everybody. But the same Jesus that saved me can also save you. And so Paul has this conversation because he understands that I was broken. I was abused. There was things in my life that I struggled with. I also broke people. I abused people. But God gave me this grace. He gave me this purpose. And I've been walking with him this whole time. And so now you see this conversation is changing. And so he starts to talk to King Agrippa based off his life and his testimony. And he says this, 26 verse 14. And and when he had all fallen to the ground, when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick. It is hard for you to kick against the goals. Now, Paul has given this message multiple times. You see snippets in many of the epistles about his Damascus Road experience. So Damascus Road experience is the theological foundation of how Paul met Jesus. And so since that's his theological foundation, he preaches pretty much everything off of that concept. But what's interesting is the last part of that scripture is that you see Jesus talking, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. That is the only place in scripture that that statement appears, and Jesus says it. It didn't appear in Acts 9. It doesn't appear in Acts 22. It doesn't appear in the epistles. And so I had to ask the question, what do you mean by that? Because now you've added something new, even though Jesus said it. And so he said, you're kicking against the goats. And so this is what this means. In agricultural times, you would have it where a shepherd's job is to lead and protect a flock. Okay? I'm going to tell you how important a shepherd is. We go to a church called Good Okay, point exactly. I proved my point. Okay, so we have this understanding of a shepherd. And so a shepherd's job is to lead and protect its flock. Now, oftentimes, animals don't look at nobody else. I'm talking about animals, not people, okay? We're talking about animals here, okay? Animals are a little bit hard-headed. Sometimes animals don't listen. 
And sometimes animals want to do their own thing. And so what would happen is you would goad them. And what the shepherd would do is he would take a long stick, and on that stick would have a point. And on that point, he would put it very close to the animal. Now, mind you, a shepherd is not going to harm. So for the most part, they never actually poke the animal. They would just keep it there. So if the animal got off track, they would automatically hurt themselves because the shepherd is goading them. And so what you see is he's saying it got so bad. And what happens with animals is goading becomes irritating. In the Greek, golden can also be transla- translated as irritated. So almost to say the conversation is saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the goals? Almost to say, Paul's saying, God, stop irritating me. I, I don't want to go that w- I got to go this way. I'm having fun being a killer and a kidnapper. But he says, I have more for you. But no, God, I'm I'm having fun over here. No, no, I have more for you. And so what he does is goad him, and there's times in our lives where God goads us, where God irritates us to the point, and he has something there where he doesn't harm you, but he just makes sure you go in the direction he needs you to go in. And sometimes when you kick against the goad, it becomes difficult. Pastor Todd says it like this. You can go easy or you can go hard, but either way you're going. And this is the conversation that he's reflecting on. Because he's saying, I had a whole life over here where I was a killer, where I was a kidnapper. But God took this stick and he put it right there. He said, I want to guide you. So every time I was walking straight, I get distracted. So I would say, oh, that's a pretty color. No, no, keep going straight. You're doing well. Oh, that's good. Ah, you're married. Okay, yeah, I'm married. But she's, no, no, keep focusing on that. Ah, God, I want to do this. No, there's a career. No, no, keep focusing on that. I've called you to this. So what you see is golding leads to movement and movement leads to your purpose. And so sometimes God has to irritate you and God has to talk to you and put you in uncomfortable situations for you to get to the purpose that he's called you to. This is where Paul is right now. He's making these statements. And Paul is saying, I tried to resist the gold, but he won't let me up. And for a lot of us, we're fighting against it. We're saying, God, I, I don't have a purpose. And God is saying, I have a purpose. The problem is the purpose I have for you isn't as pretty as you want it to be right now. But I need you to keep going forward. But, but God, I have a lot of things going on in my life where well, I don't know if I can do it. He said, no, no, you're doing the right thing. Just keep going forward. And the problem is, and maybe I'm not going to talk to you, I'm going to talk to me because I realize I'm the problem, okay? Y'all probably got together. I don't. So I'm going to talk about me for a second. The problem is when I walk with Jesus long enough, every so often, things look shiny, and I like to do a detour. And I told Jesus, I said, Jesus, I'm going to be honest with you, this whole pastoring thing, you know, it don't pay a lot of money. So, you know, Jesus, I can talk. I bet you I can sell the mess out of a Mercedes one day. Like, you, you sure you want me to go that route? No, no, keep focusing. Jesus, you sure? Because I, I can sell a car, I bet you. I'll be a good salesman. I might leave Northern California. He said, no, 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 keep going straight. Talk about me. And he said, in that, I'm going to bless you. And that's what all our lives have to include at some point, where God goads you to direct you to your purpose, even when it makes you uncomfortable. So we have this conversation. Then, verse 15. Sorry. Verse 27 says this, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. (laughs) So, So he's had this summary conversation. He's been talking to King Agrippa, and he asked the question, King Agrippa, you heard my story. You heard I was a killer. You heard everything Jesus done in my life. Do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. So now, Paul and King Agrippa go from King Agrippa being authority to Paul being chained to now they're having almost a conversation. And so Paul is giving a message and he's giving a testimony about how Jesus changed his life. And so now King Agrippa is interested and you start to see this in text and in scripture, but the problem occurs is King Agrippa tells them later, You know, you could have been free, but you tried, but but you already appealed to Caesar. And if you didn't appeal to Caesar, 
You'll be gone right now. And Paul is very interesting because Paul makes a statement. He said, I'd rather y'all be like me except for these chains. Now, mind you, he's made his case. He's good to go. But Paul says, I'd rather you be like me except for these chains. And he's saying, right now, I'm a living proof of what God can do in somebody's life. When you look at me, you see where I've come from my pre-Jesus life. You see where I'm currently at in my post-Jesus life. And so I want you to be like me because on the outside, it looks like you have it all together because you're King Agrippa. But the reality of it is, he basically asks him a question, but do you know Jesus? Do you know a man that can save you? Do you know a man that eventually everything on this earth is going to go away? But I need you to understand that he loves you, he cares, but you have to make that choice. And so he says, I'm just here to basically let you know that I met a man named Jesus on Damascus Road. He changed my life. If he could do it for me, he could do it for you. So you see that golden leads to Paul's movement, and movement leads to Paul's purpose. And so King Agrippa is now at a place where he makes the comment, you could have been free. And it reads this, verse 32. And Agrippa said to Festus, who he met last chapter, who is bringing Paul on trial, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. You could have been set free. But understand, Paul's purpose wasn't to be set free. Paul's purpose was to minister to King Agrippa on his way to Rome. And so what you see is, you know God has been on him the whole time because the scripture says this, 32, and Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Okay, where is Caesar located at? Caesar's located in Rome. We have it now in Acts 23, 11, you see that God already gave Paul provision because Acts 23, 11 tells us this. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, you must testify also in Rome. So what they thought was Paul wanting to get free. Paul said, no, no, no. God already told me I had to do this. I had to go to Jerusalem. I had to go to Rome. It sucks. It's hard. But God is still with me. And sometimes when you're walking in your perfect purpose, you have to get out of your comfort zone because change only happens when you only can depend on God. Yeah, change can only happen when you only can depend on God. And so for a lot of us, we're asking God, what is our purpose? What's the plan you have? And God says, I get what you're doing. I understand what you want me to ask, but are you ready to get a little uncomfortable? Are you ready to get a little uncomfortable and be around people that maybe you didn't think y'all had a lot in common? That maybe you didn't think y'all had a lot of relatability? And so this is the conversation that he's having Because Paul understands his purpose, he understands that God gave him a plan, and for a lot of us, we have to understand that Paul's divine purpose was always bigger than his present problems. You've seen Paul go through everything in Acts, but he always said, God, God has me, and I'm holding on to that promise because I met a man named Jesus on Damascus Road. He changed my life. And I know if he could do it for me, he could do it for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, this conversation of just learning who you are, Father. God, we thank you that we can look at a man like Paul who goes from kidnapper and murderer to one of the founding fathers of doctrine and the founding father who he is and, and the amazing man of God and to being one of the most revealed apostles and writing most of the New Testament, God, how you could take somebody from lost to being found and how you can use us. So, God, I just pray if there's anybody here that's struggling, that's thinking that God has given up on them, that's thinking that God doesn't love them, that God doesn't care, that, God, that they see this example to say that, God, your hand is still with them, and that, God, maybe they have to get a little bit uncomfortable to see the perfect purpose you have for their life. But God, I just pray that we submit to that purpose, that God, that at the end of the day, we understand that our story doesn't change, 
but God, that you changed us who we are. And God, we love you and we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.